Well, I guess uh, I'll give you a quick overview of how we're going to go through this process here. Uh, I'm going to say a bunch of controversial things, and uh, then hopefully we can have an opportunity for a bit more discussion rather than just having me uh, stand up here and talk about a bunch of things that some of you probably already know or have had some experience with. So certainly my goal is not to spend my time talking the whole time. I, I'd love it if we could you know, spend at least half the time in some kind of discourse or argument preferred. Um, <laughs> I guess we're in an interesting time in education, and I, I suspect every generation probably says that. Uh, you know, every generation brings changes, and the moment you have changes, someone has to come by and say, look, we're in an interesting era. And, and really, every era is interesting. But uh, there's some notion, I guess, from uh, what MIT's focus is with their, their uh, center, which is focused on collective intelligence, and that's, you know, how do we take what we have at our fingertips today? How do we take the technologies? the new abilities that we have to interact with each other, new opportunities that we have to make sense of the world, how do we take those various elements and somehow work together more effectively than was ever possible before we had these technologies at our disposal? So, I mean, really, to a degree, I think that's the heart of what we're all trying to do within education, is we're looking at how can we do a better job with the tools that we have, and not just to duplicate what we're doing, but to create really an entirely uh, new reality, if you will. Now, any presentation that advocates for changes to the education system isn't complete without at least one obligatory quote uh, suggesting that it's somehow fundamentally flawed. And uh, in the uh, really an excellent uh, book, the, the Cambridge Handbook of Learning Sciences, uh, really one of the best texts I'm, I'm aware of right now that starts to move toward addressing some of the changes that we're seeing happen with technology and yet doesn't lose its footing in acknowledging the traditional elements of education. A little bit of the, you know, the, the concept of the division between the technology focus and the uh, educational aspects of it. But really, this, right at the start, the first chapter, uh, which is an edited text by Sawyer, he, he acknowledges that there, there are elements in our education system today that have not been reflective or weren't created or based on established research. Obviously, it's important that we then don't move from that concern of not being based on established research, that we don't neglect our path forward in trying to reconceive and take a new approach for learning and technology. And I'm going to suggest in the presentation here that we're seeing a, a really an, an un, you know, we're losing anchor. You know, we, we, we've lost our direction and our bearing by traditional metrics of orienting ourselves to an environment. And I think there are new opportunities that we can be oriented to the new environment, but it's an interesting a period of, of, well, chaos is probably a good word, uh, where we're finding our roots or our place more effectively. But while we're making that transition, I think it's vital that we don't neglect uh, the notion that uh, Morin has put forward and that the intent of education is really to prepare you know, every individual in society for the vital combat for lucidity. I mean, that's the goal of education. I read an interesting article just, I think, two days ago in The Independent or whatever. It magically appeared outside my hotel door in the morning, and it talked about how, because everyone's getting uh, educated these days, the value of an education is reducing. And I thought maybe it was a comical argument, but nonetheless, uh, the, the reality is that the role of education in society today uh, can't be uh, overstated uh, because it is so vital in preparing our society to be able to address the challenges that we face. Of course, and the argument that I would suggest here is that there are some structural inefficiencies in school, in education, in universities that uh, don't align with this mandate of forming a lucid, uh, comprehensive worldview society. In particular, and the, the uh, challenge I think we're starting to face here is in education, we've had death by hype. And a great example, you know, I'll see a few years ago, give, you know, five years from now, somebody will stand up and say, I looked at the program in 2008, I put it into many eyes and I visualized it. My goodness, they talked about a lot of terms that I didn't have a clue what they meant. But so we've had in the past your blogs, your wikis, your podcasts, they've somewhat given away now where we're talking Web 3.0 and Web 3D. And, you know, I mean, the nonsense just never ends. And so it's important that we don't base our pattern of rethinking education on the trends that are the current instantiation of change, namely the tools, and focus instead on some of the longer term transitions in change. And, I, and that's what I'll look at from a fragmentation perspective. One of the most valuable models that I think we can look at is the media model. 
it's not a fully accurate model to explore, but it's one that has really felt the change pressures that we're encountering in education now. They've been experiencing them for over a decade. They've been struggling with digitization. Uh, they've been struggling with how do we compete in a world where our readers, our clients, have access to information literally at their fingertips. Uh, why wait for the morning newspaper when you can grab it on Google News about five minutes after it happens? Or you might follow some development just this morning uh, you know, with the new Hadron Collider being released. Uh, if you go to twitter.com uh, slash CERN, they're, they're live twittering, you know, it went around once, nothing blew up kind of stuff. So uh, it's immediate information. You know, some people might read it tomorrow morning. Most people read it tomorrow morning in a newspaper. But a lot of people, as I checked just a couple minutes ago, 1,568 people are following the Twitter feed on, uh, with regard to CERN's activation of the Hadron Collider. So it's just this sense of, uh, we have greater control, and by giving greater control to the end user, what becomes the role of the people that used to put the content pieces together? You know, what becomes the role of a newspaper editor that used to say, we will keep this, but this doesn't go because it either doesn't reflect our ideology, it's not significant, or it might be significant, but it's not significant to the bulk, the majority. So those things have to go because it only applies to 3% of our population. We don't sell newspapers if we pander to 3% of the population. You know, so those are the kind of choices that, they, that uh, an editor would make. And so what media has done really is they've excessively fragmented. If you look, and Pew Internet's done some good research on the, uh, the information habits of uh, really newspapers as a whole, but particularly from a perspective of, of youth, uh, they do still read some traditional newspapers, but it's heavily augmented. They still watch traditional television, but they spend as much in some cases, more time on YouTube as well. So we have this uh, dramatic shift where the, what used to be a cohesive structure, a newspaper, a newscast in the evening, um, is now fragmented and broken apart. Multi-perspective and multiple elements are being included. This is certainly the case with regard to a variety of areas. One, content. Uh, we, we do different things with content than we've, we've ever done. If you're familiar, obviously, with blogging, the first presentation address or some of the growth, or at least the access to blogs and organizations, uh, wikis, podcasts, videocasts, whatever it is, there's an incredible opportunity for anyone to contribute content. Now, that certainly doesn't say it's quality content. Uh, a lot of it is, is, uh, is not. But the reality is there's a democratic capacity for anyone to create content. It doesn't fit under the domain of people who have access privilege to either a press or to certain types of uh, information. So th there's that, the democratization of that is, is very significant. And I think we've also seen our ability to converse with each other is significantly enlarged. Whereas we've seen, previously at least, our conversations were geographically based, uh, you know, and, and um, Barry Wellman from University of Toronto has done a lot of work in this, sort of the sociological analysis of, of networks. And one of the big things he found was that whereas geographically, when we're geographically confined, we talk to people because we're geographically located. When we're in an online environment, we talk to people because we have the capacity for shared interest. And so we're much more uh, methodical, if you will, in selecting the type of people that we converse with and that we have access to. Now, that does, that's not necessarily a good thing. It does produce echo chambers as well, where, where everyone thinks the same and we tell each other what we all believe, which is a bad thing. But at minimum, at least, you can now uh, have a conversation with individuals from around the world in multiple forms, whether it's an online course, whether it's in a Google group session, whether it's uh, Skype cast, which are now defunct. But I mean, there's other, Ustream would be another example. So there's this opportunity for global conversation that we just haven't had before. And it's fragmented. Our, our conversations are bits and pieces here and there, just like our content is bits and pieces here and there. But it's not just our content and our conversations, but it's also our identity. I'm not sure how, how many of you have multiple accounts. I'm going to guess everybody in here probably has two, three, five, 10, 50 different accounts on different sites. You might have your Facebook profile. Maybe you've got a profile in an Elk service somewhere. Maybe you've got your university profile. Uh, maybe you're logging into, again, I've mentioned Twitter already, or perhaps an LMS that you're using. And I mean, the list goes on and on, your YouTube account. And uh, eventually, it gets to the point where we've got so many little pieces of ourselves all over the web that to get an understanding of who we are, it's not about going to one place and saying, who's George Siemens? It's about going to the web and saying, well, here's x number of, of references to, to 
me or to you or to whoever. And it's by looking at those pieces together that we have this sense of, oh, okay, that's what this particular individual is all about. So that's fragmented. Our identity is essentially all over the map, and it's the pulling together of that identity that marketers absolutely love. That's what Facebook is doing excessively well. Facebook makes a beautiful transaction exchange. So a little bit of your soul, and we'll give you access to great tools, and in the process, we will know you better than your friends know you based on your interests and your clicking habits. Interesting transaction. Uh, but also, meaning making is distributed as well, fragmented. Look at a traditional class, and, I, and I'll be a little controversial as I go forward in the notion of a typical course, but look at a traditional class. It's structured in such a manner that the educator has said, this body of information or knowledge that I have bounded in the framework of a course is my opinion. And as you select, I mean, you know what it's like when you select something, oh, I don't like that link, oh, that author irritates me, uh, you know, heard him speak at a conference, so I'm not going to use that. And so, I mean, that's, that's the process that we use when we sometimes pick our elements in a course. It, it's a combination of ideology, sometimes just petty reactions to individuals we might not like. And that's how we put the pieces together in a course, but it reflects a framework and a mindset of one individual. And most critically, it's bounded. It, it has this sense of, of, I've made sense of this discipline for you as a learner by how I've put pieces together. And my view of education is quite the opposite. Um, I think on the one hand, education should complexify the world for our learners. Uh, education should help our learners not see a world that is more simplistic, but see a world that is much more nuanced and complex. And certainly with the technology that they have access to today and the opportunity for distributed conversations, uh, theoretically, that's possible. We haven't quite moved to the stage of how are we going to do a quality analysis of that. But at minimum, let's say the first stage, we're there. We can theoretically do it. The next stage is figuring out how to actually make it effective and, and help uh, make sense of this particular approach. So we have this fragmentation. And there's a freedom, I think, at least in fragmentation. There are a lot more opportunities available to what we can do because we have a highly fragmented approach to how we interact with content and with each other. Uh, we have what some have called sort of an end to a grand narrative, this one all-consuming narrative that helps us to make sense, either of a discipline or of an entire field. So the narrative itself has given way to something that isn't grand and universal anymore. Uh, in fact, increasingly, it's what we call a personally, creative narrative, uh, personally created narrative. What I mean by personally creative narrative is it's a narrative that's defined by the information you've had access to, the worldviews that you hold. And so it's not just the view of the newspaper, the news anchor, whoever that you're listening to. It's a narrative that you yourself have created by the piece of information that you've had access to. Or perhaps more specifically, it's a personal context. It's a narrative that reflects where we are at at a particular point in time. And it is a narrative that does evolve and, and certainly does change as we go forward. Critical, though. And this gets back to the first couple of slides where I talked about Edgar Morin's notion of lucidity. Now, emphasizing lucidity and complexity, in my eyes, are not at odds with each other. Uh, but we have this need for coherence. We have this need for a framework that helps us to make sense. Because if we don't have a framework, we see everything. And when we see everything, we're absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, anyone is. So we do need at some level a framework for making sense, whether it's looking at political events, whether it's looking at how we opt to teach in a classroom, how we opt to raise children. Uh, these are all functions of the type of, of framework that we use to help the world become a coherent place for ourselves. So it's this notion of coherence that, that uh, we haven't quite figured out how to do in this online space efficiently because fragmentation challenges that coherence. Uh, as we have little pieces everywhere, that our coherent world view starts to become increasingly difficult to hold or in, uh, difficult to comprehend. Or, as suggested, going back to the, the uh, Morin quote, uh, the, the notion of lucidity becomes challenged in a highly fragmented environment. By the same account, additional frustrations arise with fragmentation. The first one is that, our, uh, that fragmentation has a way of reducing our ability to apprehend the unity of a discipline or the unity of a field. Uh, we see these little pieces, and we don't quite know how the pieces fit together. And that puts us in a very difficult cognitive place where we, we're literally overwhelmed. So we've done a great job of taking media elements and pulling them apart. In fact, if you look at the last 20 to 30 years, that's almost exclusively what's been happening with content and with education. We've taken what used to be a book and broken it down to initially to, uh, you know, paragraphs that would be posted on a blog, and now we're down to 140 characters. 
and uh, you know, in Twitter. And so that's how we, we've taken and pulled things smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, we've done the same thing with, with uh, you know, the ability for an individual to capture an image online or just grab that one image off a website. I and mean, that was the initial intent of learning objects, wasn't it? That reusable learning objects would allow us to break learning material down to small enough pieces so they could be repurposed in multiple environments. And so in a similar sense, that's, that's what the last 20 years have been about with content is we, we've made it smaller and smaller and smaller and increasingly fragmented. Now that gives us tremendous opportunities, especially now that we have uh, resources like Yahoo Pipes or, or other services that allow us to mash up different elements or that allow us to take a part here, a part there, a part there, and create something new with it. Admittedly, the, the existing copyright system can challenge that particular viewpoint, but it is uh, one that we were currently uh, at least able to do. And the value of Creative Commons or the value of Wiki Educator or open online courses do enlarge the potential that we can recreate content in our own context. So again, that's the point I'd like to uh, keep returning to. So, but fragmentation ultimately, in order for us to have a co coherent worldview, requires that we recreate. We have to rebuild it for ourselves, not something that's built by the instructor. I mentioned the instructor who pulls the content pieces together. Now I'm referring to the notion that it's no that the learner, in order to make sense, still has to pull things together in some kind of a meaningful manner. It's the only way that we can make sense and function. So we have to ask the question of how can we foster some view of coherence in a world that's really defined by hyperfragmentation? Or put another way, you know, how do we rebuild? How do we take the 30 years of work, 20 years of work that we spent pulling content pieces into smaller and smaller elements and make something that makes sense. Now, uh, spend a little bit of time later on, uh, depending on where we're at, uh, you know, looking at a service called Digo just as an example of an interesting way in which to make sense uh, around a network manner. Uh, one way to look at this is the distinction is educationally. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you remember the days of a Rubik's Cube, and, and I think I was probably about seven, eight years old when I first encountered a Rubik's Cube, and the thing drove me absolutely nuts. And I'm not sure how many of you actually took it apart. You popped off that one little cover on the middle one, and you could unscrew it and then rebuild it, and it looked great because you put it back together. Uh, that was my, my first initial attempt at it before figuring out there's actually you know, a mathematical approach you can use to make sense of a Rubik's Cube. But a Rubik's Cube and a puzzle, I mean, they have a place. That there's a right way. If I've put a Rubik's Cube together, you would say, yes, George, all the colors are the same. You didn't cheat. You've completed the task. A puzzle is the same way. Every piece has a particular place. And my concern with curriculum is that's the view we've had. Right? Every part of our curriculum has a place. And all we need to do is get learners involved. Admittedly, this has been challenged with you know, situated learning and, and social constructivism and radical constructivism. But the view still is primarily that the world is knowable according to certain metrics and standards. Uh, and I, I would view this as being a complicated view of the world. It says that, yes, you can make sense of it. You just have to get all the pieces in the right place, and you've made sense of your world. And increasingly, we're seeing discussion of complexity theory, complexity science, or uh, a view that the world is complex. And the difference between something that's complicated, like a Rubik's Cube, which I can put all the pieces together, or a puzzle, versus something that, that's complex is that a complex entity is not exclusively knowable. The elements of the system are knowable, but the outcome of that system is not knowable. That's why you know, when the, the person doing the weather forecasting says, oh, tomorrow's going to be a beautiful sunny day, and then because of the interacting factors of these elements, tomorrow ends up being not so much a beautiful day. And that's what we face when, when we're looking at complex systems. They have a, a different approach or a different manner of uh, reconnecting and reconfiguring, which is one of the opportunities, uh, I guess, that we ourselves have when we start to consider how we create and how we design learning. The view that there is greater degree of involvement from the learner, and I'll introduce the participatory pedagogy in just a second on that. So a few examples. We've already alluded to these, so I can wing through these quickly. But we look at a traditional course. You know, what does a course do? And, and a course is seen as, as a complicated view, right? We, here's this domain of knowledge. I'll select these pieces, and I put it together, and there. Now we have something that's knowable. Uh, we have the same thing with a program uh, in any level or degree. You could keep extrapolating that uh, beyond that. Uh, we also have the notion and a high level of appreciation for the formal. Why do we value the formal more in education? Well, because the formal has a knowable structure. We can say students went from A to B to C to D, and therefore they, they're warranted some type of a degree or some type of acknowledgement of their learning. So we have a way of apprising formal learning over informal learning. Uh, the Canadian Council on Learning just released a report where they just addressed sort of the, almost the, the disdain that 
academics have for the rich learning that occurs outside of formal classroom environments. And yet, and U.S. military did a report on this years ago now, and they, they made a statement that up to 80% of our learning happens in informal environments. Now, I have no idea how you actually calculate that. I mean, that's, I'd love to see how they came to that conclusion, but most of us, I think, can acknowledge that we learn an awful lot outside of classroom environments, and the drawback with traditional education, and due to the fact that we have fragmented content, conversation, identity, it means that more and more of our learning happens not within the confines of a course or a program or a university, but outside of it. And the question we have, you know, academically at least, is how do we pull those pieces together? Um, this is just a quick diagram that you know, tries to address some of the elements of learning. Um, ignore all the things on the side and just focus on those little bubbles that are right in the center. And so on the one hand, we have formal learning. You know, we have this notion of, of education that occurs in, in a traditional structured manner that we can then accredit and, and say, yes, you learned this. But we also have experience, game-based, case-based, uh, problem-based learning as well, and increasing with Second Life or virtual worlds and, and other games in education. These are, again, learning activities that may or may not occur in a formal space. I would suggest, those of you that are educational technologists, a good majority of you have probably done the bulk of your training, if not all of it, in informal means to become competent in, in the field. Uh, some of you may have gone through and taken your formal degrees as well after the fact or even partly during, but in a lot of cases, the learning that an educational technologist has done didn't occur in a class traditionally. Even a prof I was taught at University of Manitoba said, you know, we don't use textbooks anymore. Right? I mean, our textbooks and our course, they, they, they can't be updated fast enough, so we're just using a wiki now for, for our students. So there's this sense that the education system, the way it's been designed, can't keep up with some of the changes that are happening. So anyways, you've got formal learning, game-based, simulation-based learning. We have mentoring and apprenticing, which is a wonderful model that, that uh, is not necessarily utilized, but it does happen outside of work environment. The notion of volunteering, I mean, volunteering for, for organizations that you, you know, have... Uh, a cause in is a great way of learning new skills and developing. Uh, performance support, this was huge really in the, in the 90s but still can't be overstated uh, and that's the notion of uh, having support at the point of need. A lot of us learn our computing skills, for example, with sort of this 10 foot rule, right? The people who are within 10 feet of us when we don't know how to open something or do something, that's who we ask and, and that's performance support. Or if you remember the days of Clippy, the little Microsoft beast, um, you know, it would, uh, that, that's performance support. You have a problem right there, there's help available, and that's a type of learning. It might not be deep learning, but it's learning that provides us the ability to complete a task. And then the last three, self-learning, uh, best way to look at it, that's learning that you do just because you enjoy it. It's what those of you that, that read blogs, or those of you that, you know, maybe a related field, or something that's in your field, it's the stuff that you read if you have nothing else to do, or what you participate in if you have nothing else to do. It's what you have a personal, passionate interest in. Learning you do on your own. And then we've already heard talk of, uh, you know, Wenger's notion of communities of practice. And with the huge opportunities with the web for people to interact with each other online, uh, great opportunity to contribute and be involved in multiple communities. And then finally, informal, uh, which, uh, you know, fits, I guess, in the banner of conferences, workshops, uh, those kinds of activities that may be offered by your university or you may just take on your own. Okay, so that sets up uh, you know, the notion of the formal and informal divide and how we do disservice to, we don't recognize the formal sufficiently. Uh, it also challenges the notion of what is packaged, coherent sense of content. You know, what is the centering element that we start to consider then? If everything's being fragmented, what's the role of the university or what's the role of higher education in a world where the pieces are being pulled apart to finer and finer levels? If our role is not to package and make sense of the world in a Rubik's Cube type framework, what does our role become? Namely, what are the new centers of balance? And for the institution, completely non-provocative statement on my part, the only sustainable value point in the next decade is accreditation, and I'm not sure what it is beyond that. But then, of course, Peter Drucker comes out and says, university will be obsolete in 10 years. And I think that was, what, 15 years ago? So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But the point here is, if we have, just like newspapers uh, and media, I use that as an illustration initially, what happens if the base that you're serving suddenly has control of all the tools that you used to have exclusive control over? Uh, what happens to your market? Uh, if that's what happens. And as I mentioned, the, the critical distinction, I think, for universities is to emphasize on the accreditation model that blends these various elements of learning. Um, some of you may be familiar with the concept of prior, uh, prior learning assessment and recognition. 
uh, which, which attends to that concept slightly. But again, non-controversial statement, that's the only sustainable value point in the, in the near future. Um, but what about for the learner? What, what is it that the learner does in order to make sense of this type of a world? And uh, I'll take just a second, I'll go look at, at uh, Digo's uh, as an example. But there's a quote that was put out by uh, Roy P. And he published a chapter in, um, I guess, Solomon's text, Distributed Cognitions. I think it was in 93, uh, well ahead of where we started getting very aware of this notion of distributed intelligence. And uh, his statement, which I think is very accurate, is certainly... Uh, and borne out by research in numerous fields, especially uh, neuroscience, but Edwin Hutchins as well has talked about it with regard to distributed cognition. And that's that you know, intelligence is distributed across the minds of people and the symbolic devices that we use uh, in, in numerous areas. So it, it's not that we're intelligent only in our head, and Andy Clark addresses this as well with the notion of embodied cognition, but that we're intelligent across a network and a pro across a group of connections. Or as Rumelhard puts it in his text on connectionism, uh, that the knowledge is literally within the connections. Um, just before I get to this discussion of participatory pedagogies, I just want to give you one quick example of uh, how many of you use Digo? Okay, so there's a couple of you will be familiar with this. Um, I find this to be, and stumble upon is another example, but I find this to be really one of the most fascinating tools available, and I, I'm constantly surprised there hasn't been higher adoption with this in education. Admittedly, they, they did a complete redo, I think it was in December of last year, but um, what you see with Ego, for example, you create a, a network or a group of people that you decide that you want to follow. And when you start to follow certain people, you're connected to these individuals, and then when they visit a website, they can mark up a website and annotate a website. And when you come by after the fact, you can read what they've annotated or changes that they've made to this website. For example, there's a course we're doing right now, which is an online course um, that I'm doing with Stephen Downs, and um, we've got a number of learners involved, and if you look at some of the, one of the readings that we assigned this week um, was to look at this particular document. And as different learners went through, they went through the original website. Now, no one who visits this website, unless they're logged in with Digo and if these posts have been made public, no one who actually goes to this website notices anything on this site. But on the other hand, if these are people who are part of your network, you see the individual discussion and debate happening directly within the page. Uh, it's, it seems like such a simple concept, and yet, it's, it's, in my eyes, it's astonishingly revolutionary in that it moves conversations outside of environments about the topic or the resource, and it makes the, con the, the topic retains its identity and the conversation happens around that resource in the resource's native space, and it happens in a networked or in a distributed manner. So again, I find that to be a fascinating concept that uh, I think does significantly influence what it might look like when we start to conceive of a way to make sense of the world in a networked or in a distributed manner. Uh, Stumble Upon is another great tool that, that does similar functionality. Uh, if you look at uh, Public Library of Science, uh, another great example of how they're trying to alter journals. What they've done with journals is you go to uh, Public Library of Science and they've, they've changed the scholarly process. It hasn't been horrendously successful yet. It's an interesting use of words. Uh, but um, if you go there, you can see an article of somebody who's published an article, a typical view of scholarship, right? You publish, it's out there, people may read to it and link to it, but you never talk in the document, you talk about the document. And in this case, you can now go to the site, you can annotate documents that have been published, gone through the traditional peer review process. And you can also then go by and comment on the document directly in that native documents area. So it's just a, a small indication of what I, what I mean when I try and say, what are the new centering elements in education? And for the learner, the new centering elements are the tools that enable them to function in a network manner with each other in spaces that are under their control, not the control of the institution. Final slide, and then I'd like to uh, chat. Um, the, the notion of, uh, I guess, uh, participatory pedagogy, I think, is, a, is an important one. And the emphasis here is that as educators, we don't fully formalize, create, and structure the curriculum in advance of the learners arriving. We leave room for the learner, I guess, would be another way to put it. We leave room for the learners to arrive and to contribute different pieces, to negotiate around the curriculum, or if you're familiar with the work of Carl Breider, um, he suggested, and, and he actually uses under the critique of constructivism, but he suggested that the intent of learning is not just to acquire knowledge, but it's to expand knowledge. 
And that's what he views as the critical flaw in education, is that learning should be an expansive process. And Engstrom certainly uh, shares a similar view in his, his discourse on activity theory. So what does it look like in education? What are the new centering points? As I mentioned, institutionally, if we've lost control over the means of communication and creation of content, uh, which we have. I mean, learners have it at their disposal. We still control the network when learners come onto our campus, but even that's changing as they come on with mobile phones and their connection comes with them. Uh, you know, our, our ability to control becomes increasingly diminished. And finally, we're, we're ended, as an institution, we're left with accreditation as our critical value point. But our learners, on the other hand, are suddenly given these opportunities for an enormous level of advanced interaction with each other and a centering of concepts and ideas around their personal interests. It's what I mentioned earlier is this notion of a, a, a narrative of coherence that is defined by a learner's context. It's not created outside of an individual. The learner doesn't duplicate your understanding of the world. Uh, the learner creates a context themselves that represents their understanding of the world. I think I'll pause there and uh, I talked too long, but I'll have some time for questions. Okay, I think there's a a few ideas there for some questions. Yeah. Oh, okay, so well, uh, can we use these uh, microphone things, which are sort of going to be run to you very fast, just up here, uh, so that your words can be recorded for posterity uh, and enter this sort of net of connections that uh, we live in. Oh, yeah, there yeah, we go. It's working. Um, a little while ago, people were talking about death of the author. It seems to me that you're saying that everybody's an author, and so that's not the problem anymore. Um, perhaps you're talking about... I'm making this up as I go along. I'm still thinking about your that's ideas. That's my whole life, don't worry. Yeah, about. that's... The, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, that uh, you're saying the new challenge is to... is almost to find techniques for curating or, or being editors. <laughs> And uh, that um, service that you were showing at the moment seemed to be some kind of collective editorial system. Have you got, can you sort of talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if I caught the question in there, but you're, you're right. I, I don't, we, we had a lot of discussion since the 90s, since Levy's work on you know, collectivism and collective, collective intelligence. And, I don't think that's really what we're looking at. Some of you may recall the site wearesmarter.org, which was this intent to have a group of about 1,500 academics write a business book together, basically in a wiki format. Now, I mean, just think about that for a second, and I'm not sure what, what, what they were consuming when they had this idea, but the, the view was we're going to get 1,500 academics to share. That's nice. So anyway, that obviously bombed. So what they ended up doing was the book ended up being written by a group of a couple of professional authors, even though at the time that was going on, there was huge hype about this wonderful collective activity. So it's very important to remember, and, and I didn't address that, that in the conversation here, but any move toward the collective activity has to recognize the primacy of the individual and the contributions of the individual. Uh, so certainly the notion of the death of an author, I, I, I mean, that seems ludicrous to me. Uh, the death of expertise also seems ludicrous to me. But yeah, there are different tools now that uh, at least, and, and again, I, I don't want to look at the instantiation of the tool. I mean, don't look at Digo as the example, just like don't look at blogs as the example. Look at what these tools enable and what they represent. What do they tell us about how we are and how we want to interact with, with information and how we want to interact with each other? I mean, we know MySpace turns into Facebook. Facebook turns into who knows what else uh, as the different tools come online for popularity. So. Um, yeah, the, the, the new challenge today is, is one of determining and, and uh, being able to make a coherent framework of the world uh, through these numerous elements, that, uh, information source that we encounter on an almost daily basis. And it does require perhaps different skills. Some people throw them under the banner of 21st century skills, but th that is a, a challenge that we don't quite have fully met at this stage. Uh, is what does it mean to decipher and to make sense of these, uh, this, this abundant, these, these numerous different voices, this complex environment. But that's the whole intent of it. If, if we recognize, the worst thing to do is to say, you know, take a complicated worldview, which we have as educators, right? We think the world is complicated. We're going to create content in a way that students can somehow make sense of the world. 
if we take a complicated worldview and we apply it to what really is a complex world, we have what's called a disaster because those two don't align. They don't flow well to each other. And uh, so with complexity, the notion is no one will ever know everything about their field anymore. It's just not possible. You know, even educational technologists in this room, if somebody comes to you and say, George, you're wrong here. Uh, this is what I think about this and this. The author said this and that. Well, okay, you're right. Uh, so the reality is that we just don't know everything ourselves, and that's the appeal to a distributed cognition or a distributed intelligence model. And it's learning how to function in that distributed environment that I think is the key task for, for learners and educators being able to make sense or make coherent views of the world. Yes. Uh, a couple of questions, one there, and one, I'll let you do that. That's your job. I don't want to, you're going to have to reduce your pay. A couple of questions, one there and one there. Perfect. <laughs> Question over there? Yeah, front. And then next will be up there. The gentleman by the mask. Hi. Thanks, George. That was a fascinating talk. I wanted to link um, something that you said with the previous talk and next year's conference, which you may not know has got the uh, tagline, uh, which is a quote apparently from W.B. Yeats In dreams begin responsibility. And I was thinking about a radical change like connectivism, which, um, and anybody who's trying to theorize new ways of learning. And there's all this knowledge that hasn't yet got directly onto the internet. So in order to understand learning that's more informal across society, it seems to me we have to draw on other disciplines. That's how it links back to the previous point about boundary crossing. So, Without being negative, how do we think about the dangers of, you know, our responsibility in being part of a radical change is to think about what the dangers are, which requires us, in my opinion, to look at a much broader set of disciplines. So how does this dialogue take place between what's happening on the blogosphere and what's happening perhaps in some areas where people aren't engaging in that sort of thing and aren't going to, but have still got something really radical to say. And as you said, it's not just about us reading what they say, it's also about them reading what's happening. Yeah. So I just wondered how we could respond to that challenge. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big question. We have another half hour, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, the uh, Neil Postman, has uh, certainly written with a critical perspective on technology as a whole. And one of the things that he said is every technology has an ideology and every technology gives and takes. So if we start to use one tool, it, it will give us new opportunities. And, and I, you know, I don't want to use the word affordance as I had a chat with somebody about this this morning. I mean, affordances was Gibson's initial concept and it was tied to perception. It was, it was sort of you know, abducted by Norman when he started to apply it to technological dimensions, which was very different than how Gibson meant it. But anyway, um, so every technology has certain things that it permits us to be able to do. But when we start to use it, it also takes other things away. Uh, for example, if we say, well, you know, blogs or wikis, well, they do certain things well, but they also take away the control of the teacher, partly, at least. The, that's why institutions sometimes want to control things and keep them in an LMS. So how do we get that dialogue, though, going outside of those spaces to recognize that there are unique dimensions to technology and there are things that, aren't, that, that we need to be aware of? Or more broadly, you know, people who come along and rant at the current state of the world, I mean, you know, that's what every generation is supposed to do, right? That's how, that's how we have fun in our spare time, I guess. But you can't take the... Um, the, the view and say, hey, everybody should be a blogger. If everyone blogs, we'll have a good education system. Well, I mean, that's utter nonsense. Uh, you know, there are things that the education system does now that it does extremely well. And that's one of the concerns I've had with, definitely within a lot of the, the edu blog conversation, at least, is that it suggests if we all had a wiki and a blog and no teachers anywhere and no institutions, we would have a beautiful learning cult, you know, culture. I, I, I mean, I can't even begin to engage with that discussion because it's so far out there. So we have to recognize, and I tried to mention this right at the start, is that there are aspects of the educational system that serve us very well and that we need to preserve. And it's recognizing what is it that traditional education does well in terms of engaging learners in critical thought and in helping them to understand a new and some complex worldview. There was a paper done about two years ago now by uh, Harvard, which was their new 
uh, undergraduate competencies or the new critical skills that everybody who graduates from Harvard needs to have. And those were skills like being able to understand oneself as a product of history, being a critical creative thinker, being an ethical person. And it relates to uh, Ron Barnett. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work on super complexity uh, in education. It relates to his work where he says perhaps education is becoming one where we shift from epistemology to ontology. We, count, we shift from knowledge to being and becoming. And John Seeley Brown addresses this as well. So now I've taken an enormously long way around to get to your question, which is that's the challenge academically is to engage in a, a dialogue, a participatory dialogue with related fields of, of change and, and development. There are some examples out there. We're not hacking our way through a jungle without examples. Uh, I tried to use, for content at least, media, what's happened with media. Uh, there are certainly examples with online conversation that education can look to and not say how do we apply this in our organization, but how do we adapt this to our organization. I mean, those are some of the challenges. But I, I, beyond that, I mean, that seems like such a superficial answer to it's a very complex problem, but it is one that, that we do need to engage in. And educators, fortunately, I think are much more receptive now than they were five, you know, seven, eight years ago when, when you know, blogs were still the, the ludicrous element of people who have no lives. And, and I should make. I just want to keep talking. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm done. I was just going to make one point. Just recognize with a conversation here. I mean, I see there's a three-stage model, which I think is vital. And you know, first we have the conceptualization. That's where we do all the fun thinking, blue skying, you know, nonsense stuff. After that, the conceptualization forms our experimentation, which experimentation leads to implementation. So it's important to remember that we're not analyzing. You know, I, I presented a conceptual talk here today. Uh, it's tough to analyze what I talked about by an implementation standard without first going through the experimentation stage. So, you know, just recognizing the, the, the nature of that. Good question. Hi. Um, it seems to me that our, our current um, uh, practices in accreditation are very heavily based on this, no this notion of control. We, we, we sort of test conformity to what we think the curriculum should be. And so if you recognize that we we lost or are losing that control, but we want to keep the accreditation. We need to base that on, on something completely different. I'm curious to your views as to what the basis of that accreditation should be. <laughs> uh, well, I, I did a, uh, there's a paper online I can direct you to for a conference. I think I'm actually, Graham and I will both be in Portugal in, in October, um, and, and it was for that conference. And it was titled, you know, the, the New Spaces and Structures of Learning, and, and uh, I sort of suggested an approach of what accreditation might look like. Uh, in that kind of a model, but it's, it's tough to say what it will look like because it's really too early. We're, we're not even asking the question yet. I mean, universities are not significantly asking the question, how do we accredit learning that goes on outside of our classroom? Why? Well, we've defined classrooms as our value point of learning. MIT took away the content part and said, you know, open educational resources, content is not our value point anymore. Uh, and now that we see more and more opportunities for conversation and connections online, uh, around content and with other learners, suddenly I'm starting to question whether classrooms are a sustainable value point in education. That brings us to accreditation. What does that look like? How could that function? Uh, I mean, so many directions that can go in. Prior learning and ass assessment and recognition is the only model that I've seen to date that's, that does it with rigor. It does look at a very structured model of determining competence. It is applied extensively in relation to industry as well. But it's a much broader conversation than, than I think we can have here today. But you know, if you want to look at, at the PLAR model, that's one area to start. OK, I'm sorry. That's it. That's all the time. I'd be happy to go on longer. But we have more another session starting at 11. On behalf of all, it seems, that under here we have a bag of something. I'm not <laughs> entirely sure you can get this on an aeroplane, so you might have to drink it with people tonight. Uh, but there you are, George. Thanks very much for a wonderful session. Thanks. Thank you.